Durer wasn't the only Renaissance artist who seemed to have a prophetic eye. Leonardo da Vinci, scientist, inventor, musician, architect, sculptor, and painter, was a primary influence in his time. A dominant characteristic of Leonardo's personality was his desire to re-examine every aspect of his world. His notebooks are filled with intricate writings and sketches, scientific observations, endless studies. His utter fascination with sight, how the eye perceives, led him to a series of experiments. His goal? To understand the physiology of the eye itself. He rejected the ancient notion that light rays emanate from the eye. Instead, he argued that light enters the eye. Of course, he was right. An important element of Leonardo's optical research was his analysis of light and shadow. The language of visual art makes extensive use of light and shadow. Light, how it falls on and defines form, is a critical tool for creating illusion. Filmmakers often borrow lighting ideas from the masters to bring out form or to create various moods. During the Renaissance, the artists made careful observations of the effects of light and shade and then applied those principles to give a greater illusion of depth to their paintings and drawings. The simplest form of all, the sphere, was the basis for establishing the rules of light and shade. When modeling is added, including a shadow on the form and a shadow cast by the form, the drawing begins to appear more three-dimensional. With the addition of a heightened core shadow, the area between light and shade, the illusion of reflected light creates an even more convincing sense of depth. The Renaissance masters applied these techniques to more complex forms. Some of the most beautiful images from the Renaissance are drawings that exhibit these basic principles of light and shadow. These drawings are from Michelangelo's studies for the Sistine Chapel. These are examples of Raphael's figure studies. The masters reached even greater heights of illusion when using these principles of light and shade in their paintings. Late in the Renaissance, Raphael painted with bold, theatrical lighting effects. Leonardo experimented on a very subtle scale, softening the shadows, creating a superbly delicate contrast of light and dark. Leonardo's observations of the subtleties of light and shade may have led him to examine the visual effects of atmosphere itself. In the hills surrounding Florence, Leonardo first observed, the air which is interposed between the eye and the seen object obscures the object to some extent. And if the interposed air is of considerable quantity, then the seen object will be strongly tinted with the color of this air. Well, that's another way of saying that as distance increases, the background becomes more blue with atmospheric haze and reduces in contrast as well. 
In the movie business, we use fog machines to create the same effect. We call the effect atmospheric perspective. Leonardo called it the perspective of disappearance. You can easily see Leonardo putting his observations into practice to enhance the depth of his paintings. The foreground contains warm or red-yellow tones. The background becomes cooler, more blue, and has less contrast as it recedes. In exploring depth illusion, the Renaissance artists used their magic to create visual riddles as well. One of the most intriguing was anamorphic art. In the 1490s, Leonardo drew the first known anamorphic or stretched image. When seen from a normal viewing spot, from the front, it looks like nothing more than a pool of water. However, when viewed from an extreme angle, it takes on a new appearance. One of the first to master the anamorphic technique was a German artist, Erhard Schoen. Schoen created anamorphic illusions that disguised double meanings within the images. For example, in this picture puzzle, Schoen mixes portraits with scenes from an historic battle. His clever illusion lampoons the royalty with comic portraits, while contrasting them with the serious nature of the battle giving a new twist to an art form as old as government itself, political satire. Portraiture became one of the more common uses of anamorphic art. Probably the most famous example of anamorphic art during the High Renaissance is this painting by Holbein the Younger, best known for his portraits of Henry VIII's court. At first glance, the painting seems fairly obvious. It's a double portrait. However, on second look, you can see something strange in the painting, something smeared across the floor. When the painting is tilted, the smear changes into a recognizable form, a human skull. Some scholars believe that the painting contains a message of salvation, emphasizing that death comes to all in spite of our worldly acquisitions and learning. Others have suggested that the skull is actually a pictorial pun, playing off Holbein's name, which in German means hollow bone. The exploration of wide-angle perspective led to other results besides anamorphic puzzles. The masters began experimenting with unexpected viewpoints, the way movie makers today use camera placement. One painter in particular explored this idea to great effect, Andrea Mantegna. This remarkable painting, unfortunately destroyed during the Second World War, beautifully illustrates the sense of drama that Mantegna achieved through his creative use of point of view. The young jailer in the foreground, begging forgiveness, provides the motivation for the unusual angle. He forces himself to look up at St. James, the very man he kept imprisoned. Mantegna makes us identify with the jailer's humility by placing us at ground level with the jailer. In a later painting, Mantegna once again forces the viewer to sit at the feet of his subject. Yet this time, it's an even more powerful effect. The artist brings Christ's feet right up to the viewer, making us vividly aware of Christ's wounds. The point of view is stark and severe. Mantegna pushes the spectator closer than he wants to be, close enough to feel the coldness of death. In the Ducal Palace in Mantua, Mantegna was commissioned to paint a small ceiling. He used the opportunity to create another striking viewpoint, but this time for a less serious purpose.
characters in the painting look down on us as if they are the ones enjoying the view. They become the spectators, we become the observed. With so many visual principles fully established, the masters began using the techniques of illusion on a monumental scale. During this explosion of creativity known as the High Renaissance, Michelangelo and Raphael were commissioned to decorate the walls and ceilings of the Vatican. They went beyond drawing and painting, redefining the limits of architecture itself, literally exploding the boundaries into the heavens. Michelangelo's work in the Sistine Chapel eloquently expresses his knowledge of form and his love of light and shade. Michelangelo has made these figures heroic, larger than life. In another part of the Vatican, the young Raphael created his own visions. Renaissance was to end in the 1520s, Raphael to become its final master. Raphael's fresco called the School of Athens certainly utilizes the techniques of illusion, but it does more than just present beauty. It chronicles Raphael's time. In it, Raphael has painted portraits of Leonardo, standing in the center as Plato, and on the left, Michelangelo as another Greek philosopher. These great masters of illusion are caught in one image for all time. And back in the right-hand corner, almost hidden, stands young Raphael, looking innocently yet confidently at the viewer. Perhaps he knew that the masters of illusion and their visual achievements would not soon be forgotten. In fact, they were to set the foundations of the visual arts for centuries to come.